Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen to my car. I don't know what's going to happen to our house. I don't know what's going to happen to any investments that I have. I don't even know what's going to happen to my job or my health or anything else. I don't know that. So I need to prepare for the future. Well, that's not entirely wrong. But sometimes what we've done is we have put God over to the side and says, I have to take care of my security for my future. And all of a sudden, it's resting on us. So if something happens, then all of a sudden, our security starts shaking, and then we start having some problems because it's all about taking care just in case something happens. So then we throw out, give 10%, save 10%, and live on the rest. We don't then live up to that because of the security issue. I'm going to tell you right now, I can't guarantee if I'll have my house, my clothes, my wife. I can't even protect my reputation. It's going to be out there. But the one thing that I can be secure in is this. And that is my intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And my God says this, that when I choose to live according to the scripture, by his power, for his glory, in his timing, God says, all your needs will be met now and even in the days of your retirement. And so my security is found in Christ. Now let me give you the biblical worldview on this. And that is, we talked about security. Why do we want to save? One is for security, but we go through the Lord for that, not through our own way. Now yeah, you do need to save. You heard me say that. But not because God won't take care of us, but because saving is right. The second is how we spend our money. All right, stewardship. And so I'm going to talk about some ways to uh, manage your money. So young people, if you're listening to this, let me give you three reasons for you to manage your money. Here it is. Number one. It prevents us from impulse buying. When you have committed to the value that as much as I have, I am going to save this money here. Therefore, what's more important is not so much my impulse buying because I went to the store, I went to the mall, I went to the flea market, I went to a garage sale and I have to get this. It's because I have a higher value over here that first of all, I need to save. It is biblical. So it'll help you from that impulse buying because you made your higher priority saving. Let me read the verse to you so it's not just my wisdom. It says, The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man saves whatever he gets. Proverbs 21, 20. The second is it allows us to be able to help other people when they have a need. And money comes in and money goes out. If I hear that there is a need with a person, with a group, with a missionary, I don't have anything to give to them. And so when I save some money and there's a genuine need, not an impulse buying need because I want to get a better bell or better whistle or to upgrade something, it's I'm saving money. Now with a clear mind, when I hear a need, you have a need, the church has a need, a missionary has a need, someone in our community has a need, then I can carefully look at what I've saved, look at the way I strategize my money, and with a clear conscience and purposely, I can now take some of my savings and help someone else in need, which is what God says we're to do. And so that helps me. So why do I manage my money? So I don't impulsively buy. Why? So I can help the needs of others. And number three, it gets your money working for you rather than you working for your money. Usually when you're saving money, you won't be like that elderly person I described earlier. You're not going to put it under a mattress or put it in a can and bury it in your backyard. Most of you will begin to evaluate what are safe investment programs. Now let me pause and say this. The Bible biblically talks about investing your money, your talents, what God has given you so that it will reap more. So what's happening now, your money or your resources are going to do your working for you. And so that's, it'll only do that if you have money that you save to do that. But if it's money in, money out, you won't have that money then saved to be able to do that. So number one, there's a right way to accumulate it. And that frankly is trusting God to take care of your needs and he will provide for you. How do we appropriate it? That's the second issue. All right, what's the biblical way as a Christian, the right way to do it? Well, let me give you a negative on this. It's found in Proverbs 13, 11, and here's what it says. Wealth from gambling quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows. So let me speak for just a moment on gambling. All right, here it is. <clears throat> what is gambling? 
Now, gambling might bring you a certain degree of fun. It might be something that you made some money at, but if the, the chips were down, how do you like that phrase? If the chips were down, you probably lost more than you won over the course of everything, probably. But basically, it's boiled down to one phrase. Gambling feeds an attitude of get rich quick. Now, I know it might take you a while to get money off your gambling, but it doesn't go into actually getting rich quick. It's the attitude that you could get rich quick. So you're driven more by this attitude of getting a lot of money without having to work for it, kind of hoping that you'll get it, and this is the best way because it becomes legal. All right, in some states. So we're going to be facing that issue here, whether it's candidates or it'll actually be on the ballot. But someday we're going to have to step up and say, is that something that we want as our core value on the island of Oahu or the state of Hawaii? It's going to be our choice. And those who are biblical will want to make the decision that gambling is not a healthy thing to do for our people. You might say, well, I can handle it. That's true, but others may not. Let me read another particular verse to you that might help you. Proverbs 14, 23 says this, Hard work brings a profit. That's different than get rich quick through gambling. Hard work brings a profit. Mere talk leads to poverty. Proverbs 14, 23, in a, in a paraphrase, says this, Work brings profit. Talk brings poverty. In another paraphrase, it says, A lazy man will never have money. But an aggressive man will get rich. If you're lazy, you'll never get what you're after. But if you work hard, you can get a fortune. Bottom line is this, that when we want to appropriate our money and get our money the way that we can get it, the best way to do that is just flat out working two ways. Smart, that would be do what the Bible has to say. We know the wisdom of God and wisdom of his word. So we do it smart. We work smart. But we also work hard. By the sweat of our brow, Genesis talks to us about and how important it is to get our money that way. I would just caution you. I won't speak against this. I will just caution you about multi-level marketing. Um, most of the multi-level marketing begins by talking about how much money you can make, the easier life. You don't have to work as hard. They parade examples of people like that in front of you who have done that, which are very few compared to how many entered into that program. And then at the same time, they talk about the quality of their, pro their products or service. And sometimes if you do enough study on it, the quality of their products and service don't always pass every one of the smell tests that's out there. And thirdly, you often have to do some kind of buy into this program or you have to get others to buy in it that are your friends. So all of a sudden you have um, um, encouraged them to get into it. So... I cannot say you can't do that. I will just say, watch your motives. Watch your relationships by doing this. Put up in front of you a threshold. Ask yourself, am I following a get-rich-quick way to do this? Now, that being said, let me give you one possible positive. If you do choose that this is clean and clear and you've got the green light from all of your family and you've prayed through it and you sense this is exactly, you've done your homework, then remember, even in those multi-level the ones, the few that I do know that have made it to the top, they did not do it after work. They worked 40 to 60 hours along with their other job for many years before it started to return on their investment. And then I still wonder how that helped them spiritually when they went through it. All right, I'm going to leave that alone. Do you still love me? I love you. Okay. Now I need to answer this question. How much money could a Christian legitimately make? Well, I'm going to suggest four qualifications if you're going to say, okay, is it wrong to make money? It is absolutely not wrong to make money. The only problem is sometimes when we do this, we'll spend 16 years in school learning how to make money, but then we spend six weeks learning how to spend it or invest it. And that to me is a wrong imbalance. But be that as it may, I think there are four qualifications that would help us to understand, is making money as a Christian legitimate? Here they are. There's four of them. You run your own attitudes and, and motives through these. Number one, it is okay as long as it doesn't hurt your own health. There are a lot of people today that have lost some health either through anxiety or fear or they haven't taken care of, they haven't slept well, they don't eat right, they don't exercise, they don't have time to do the things to take care of. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Your body. You might say, ooh, that sounds so selfish, your body. Actually, my body is actually the temple of the Holy Spirit and that I am... Um, I have to take care of this so I can do more for him, and so I don't want to do things that will hurt this here. So if making more money is going to hurt this, and I'm driven by greed to get more, and it's hurting this temple, then there's something wrong with it. Now, does that say making money is wrong? No. It's when we step over the line where it's costing us our health. Listen to uh, this verse found in Proverbs 23, 4. It says, 
Do not wear yourselves out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. All right, here's the second qualification, and that is as long as it doesn't hurt your family. A lot of times people are trying to get more money. They're sacrificing relationships with their mates. They're certainly sacrificing relationship with their kids, and sometimes they're doing this so they can buy more for their kids. And Often now we begin to transfer our time with our kids, quality time of teaching and relationship, and we buy them more trinkets and baubles for them to play with that occupies their mind. Now watch this. Listen carefully. Once we've done that, the kids are now so jammed up into these video games and so much playing and all the stuff that they have that now as a parent you say, hey, you know what, i got some time, let's go play ball. No, no, let me finish this, let me finish this. And they don't have time anymore. Does that sound like your house? Boy, you got quiet on me. Well, I'm not against video games. I'm not against buying things for your kids and stuff like that. I'm just saying, ask yourself, man up, woman up, parent up. Is this hurting your family by working two and three and four and five jobs so you can keep up with all your clothes, food, and your stash of jewels? I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not, I, don't shoot the messenger. Just ask yourself. Number three, the third qualification. As long as it doesn't hurt other people, it's okay. As long as it doesn't hurt other people. I know we live in a dog-eat-dog world. We have the attitude. Get all you can, can all you get, sit on the can and spoil the rest. You know, we have to be careful of the attitude of try to accumulate so much it's at the expense of others. Listen to Proverbs 21, 20. It says this, A fortune can be made from cheating, but there's a curse that goes with it. Proverbs 16, 8 says, It's better to have a little honestly earned than a large gain of income. So just think about that. And what am I doing now? Am I defrauding other people? Am I hurting others outside my family? Am I hurting others? Or am I adding value to them? And here's number four. As long as it doesn't hurt you spiritually. Put a star by that one. You might check your health and say, I'm okay. My family, they, don't, they understand. Other people, I'm not cheating them, so it's okay. Now, how is it hurting you spiritually? It's all in a balance. If you find yourself because you're in so much debt that you have to miss church or you have to miss Bible study or you can't have a quiet time or you can't get involved in a mission outreach, you can't do ministry because you're so busy for this, then I'm going to tell you it will affect you spiritually. And Satan will tell you, well, the Bible doesn't say you have to be in church at 1030 every Sunday morning. I realize that. I, I, I'm a big guy, pastor. I know that. But on the other hand, the Bible does say not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And we need to do it even more because we're living in the last days, the Bible says. So not less, more. And so when we come on Wednesday night and we, we practice a little bit in our praise team and then we scoot out of here without a little bit of time of Bible study, let me just encourage you. Just a little bit of fellowship and interaction around God's Word and hearing the prayer requests and the blessings of others is so rich. So whatever you're doing, just watch your time. 3 John 2 says this, Beloved, I wish that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So it's talking about balance. Just as you want to grow yourself inwardly here. He says, also, I want you to prosper. So the balance would be, if you don't take care of your inner, your outer is going to get out of whack. A lot of times people are having trouble with the first half of my message because they haven't taken care of the second half of the message and this part about taking care of your soul right. And I don't have anybody in mind. I'm not speaking to any names here. I'm just giving you some things for you to humble yourself as I have to do, just like you do. This message is for me before the Lord. So we talked about how to accumulate it, how to appropriate it. Now, how do we allocate this thing? Well, let's talk about it. Proverbs 21.5 says, The plans of the diligent lead to profit, as sure as haste leads to poverty. So the question is, is how do we spend our money? And that's what's important. A lot of us have a greater yearning power than we have an earning power, and that's a real problem with us. So how do we really spend our money? I know sometimes you'll hear that, hey, this is, you buy this right here, it's only 162 easy payments. I've never known payments to be easy payments, have you? They're always a challenge, you know? And so maybe we need to be careful of that. And I just give you that. So what's the key? What's the key if I'm going to now get, get rid, use my money? Here it is. It's the word budget. 
Write that down, if you will. It's the word budget. If I use my planned spending, I will be all right. So be careful on how you use your money. So what's a budget? It's simply planned spending. That's really what your budget is all about. Um, I'm going to show you this. Carol and I are not wealthy. You know I drive a beach car and it looks a lot better today because you, for my birthday, have got it painted. One window doesn't go up, the air conditioning doesn't work, and the locks keep going clicking on and off, but it looks pretty. But I'm grateful for that car. You know why? Because it gets me where I need to go, go, go. All right? In style. With sweat. But it's good. We have another nice car. We live in a nice, comfortable home. Not very large, but a, a nice home. It's a clean home, and I'm grateful for that. We don't get paid a great deal, but I'm grateful for every penny that you sacrifice so that our staff has an adequate and an honorable income to be able to live very satisfactory in this island. But the reason you see our staff doing as well as they are, it's not because they're rich or they're paid very well or someone's slipping them money or they've got a rich quick scheme or they go to Las Vegas to gamble. You know what they have? A lot of them have what I show you right here. You know what this is? This is just nothing more than a cheap old Walmart ledger that we've divided up the money that we owe and we put money in our account. This is our budget. Now, Carol and I have this and I have it in QuickBooks on my screen. Now, I probably wouldn't need to do this, this little, if I knew how to do QuickBooks better. <laughs> so I got them both. Now, this doesn't make us wealthy. No more money comes in by having these. All it does is it helps us to spend our money based on a budget more wisely so then we can do, watch this, and have the things that we have with the little that we have as far as income coming in. I'm only telling you this not because we're great, it's because we've been on that other side and we came to a message like this and we paid the price of having to redirect or correct. You know, when you go off the path for so many years, it takes a while to get on the right path, but we turned around and we faced that right path and we walked on it long enough. And then God says, you know, since you did that, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven and begin to bless you. Not with million dollar bills and great inheritance. But a $100 gift here and a $50 gift there and a gift certificate here and a special gift over there. God has been so good to us. I'm only telling you this not because we're great, but because if God can do it for Carol and me and your pastors, I know God is wanting to do that for you. It's budgeting, keeping good records. Finally, how do you apply it? Well, how we apply it is going to be What's important? Proverbs eleven twenty four and 25 says this. It is possible to give away and become richer. It is also possible to hold on too tightly and lose everything. Yes, the generous man shall be rich. How? By watering others, he will water himself. So money does have influence. What you do with it counts. You've heard the word miserable. Some of you are miserable. And it could be. Because there's another word in the word miserable. It's the word miser. We kept all of this so we can spend it on ourselves instead of getting all of this so we can add value to other people. Well, today isn't a message so much about write us a check. We need to do more for the parking lot. We need some more help around here. No, it's not about that. That is byproduct. What it is all about is for you to have a clear conscience before the Lord because you have come to a point to say, you know what, a child of God does not have to be a beggar. And if he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he is my Savior, he is my Lord, and he is my Father, and he is, watch this, a benevolent Father, then God wants me to have this. And here's how he tells me to receive it from him by altering what I do. So this is not a health and wealth gospel message. This isn't a name it and claim it message. This is a humble yourselves, do what God has to say, and let God take care of you for the rest of your life, bountifully as he promises to do. Let's up our heads and close our eyes. I want you to have a time for you to really not let Satan to distract you from a time you need to be with God. And so I'm going to boil it down into two areas. The first one is this. You will never get this issue resolved in your mind about wealth until you have a relationship with Christ with your sins forgiven. To be in His family and to have God as your forever Father. Now what you need to do is like all of us have done. 
We realize that we're a sinner. We have broken His laws. We've lived for ourselves. We know that we've manipulated, intimidated. We've lied, cheated, stole, clawed our way through life. We've left a trail of broken relationships. And we are just burdened by guilt. And then we heard about the guilt bearer. The one who would forgive us of all sins. The one who not, the one who not only could do that but as the one who wanted to do that and as the one that once it's done, my guilt is gone. And here's what they did. Those folks that are seated right near you today went to the Lord and said, Lord, I am a sinner. I have broken your laws with my, my, my attitude, my actions. Lord, I know that because I'm a sinner, I'm separated from you and I will spend eternity in a real place called hell. And not because you wanted me to go there, but because I've chosen to go there because I didn't want to go to heaven your way. And so, Lord, now I'm coming to you, realizing that I have to be perfect, but I'm not. But, oh, Lord, I could never be good enough to go to heaven. Now, they did that. They also heard the verse that says that good works wouldn't get them into heaven. So no matter how many things they tried to do, how many laws they tried to keep of God, they knew that their, their good works wouldn't get them there. They were so hopelessly lost. So then they heard how Jesus died and rose again and by his blood and his payment he made on the cross he forgave them of all sin so they could have eternal life. And the people that are seated right around you and for ages and ages and ages they simply placed their faith alone in Christ who died and rose again. Because Jesus himself who is God said he that believes on me has everlasting life. And at that very moment God forgave them of all guilt took the burden of sin off of them, placed it on himself, washed it away with his blood, cast it in the sea of forgiveness, rose again from the dead, and not only became their forever savior, but came to live his life out in them to give them the power to do the things that they want to do today. Now, my friend, that's waiting for you. But you must receive it from the Lord. He's knocking on your mind and your heart right now. He's saying, I'm speaking to you. You realize you're a sinner? You realize I'm the Savior? Would you trust in me? So simply say this to the Lord. Lord, I know I've done things wrong. I need and want your forgiveness. And you said you'd forgive me if I trust in you. And so, Lord, I believe you are the Lord, the only Lord. And I am now trusting in you as my personal Savior. Now, if you sin afterwards, God says, I'll discipline you, but I won't kick you out. So is there anyone in here today that would like to tell me silently, without a word, that you're trusting Christ? I'd like to pray for you. So without anyone looking around with every head bowed and every eye closed, and you'd like for me to pray for you, because today is the day you're trusting Christ. Now, Christians, the second half of that is this. You know God loves you. You know that I love you. But these principles are biblical and they're doable because the Spirit of God will give you the power. Is there anyone in here today who would say, Pastor, I, I learn now that being wealthy and getting wealth is not wrong if I do it from a biblical point of view for His glory. And so I need help because I'm going to go to my, 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 my meager funds and I'm going to look at my coming paychecks and I'm going to now begin to redirect my funding. Knowing that there'll be pain at the beginning as I take the splinter out. But there'll also be healing at the end. And an abundance of blessing. So pastor, would you pray for me? Because right now, I am going to change my habits. Based on what I learned from the Lord through James today. Would you pray for me? Father, you know our hearts. You know that we cannot do this. But you can through us. Therefore, we will. And so we give you the, the power and the, the glory for this. Now, Father, I look to those that have trusted you as Savior, that they would read in your Bible what it means now to be a Christian. And that this book is not to take away our fun, but to add to us. And so, Father, help us to get in your word and help us to be faithful on Sundays and 
and small group studies, places where we can go, where we can really worship and love one another and be loved and share our gifts with them and have them share their gifts with us. And then, Father, I pray that we talk to you in prayer, personally, but at the same time in group with needs. And then we'd also share the gospel with others. Now, Father, thank you for what you're doing in our midst and thank you for the way you bountifully blessed us. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.